point that I want to look at briefly now is by James P. Cars called Finite and Infinite Games, a vision of life as play and possibility. It is with immense sadness that I found out just a few days ago that James Cars passed away in September of last year. I had the, the great pleasure of meeting him in Los Angeles around 15 or 20 years ago. We had a lovely lunch together with a couple of other friends. And the occasion for that meeting was that just shortly before that I had written to him perhaps a year or two ago and invited him to contribute a pamphlet to a pamphlet series that I founded and that I've edited over the course of the last 20 years. Uh, the series was founded in 2002. It's called the Dissenting Knowledges Pamphlet Series. And Professor Kars contributed the ninth pamphlet to this series called Ignorance and the Durability of Religion, a Parable. So we had exchanged correspondence. The people who contribute to this pamphlet series contribute after an invitation from me. So I commissioned the pamphlets and then edit the pamphlets with working together with the author. And so Mr. Carson and I had had a wonderful exchange. He had contributed this pamphlet to the series, but we had never met. And then it so happened that he was going to be coming to Los Angeles and that became the occasion for our meeting. Now that I've shared this anecdote about my acquaintance with Professor Kars, whom I found to be an extremely pleasant and intelligent person, I want to move to the subject matter of the book itself. I don't think there's ever been a book quite like this one. Now, as someone who has taught at UCLA for 27 some odd years, 25 years, I have often heard students tell me that such, a, such and such a course or a particular book perhaps changed their life. I, I am also pleased to say, although I don't take it very seriously, that I've often heard this expression in the student evaluations from my own courses. I took a course with Professor Lal and it has utterly changed my way of thinking. Uh, I've read this comment, but I've also read this comment when I have read the evaluations that students have written about other professors. So one learns not to take these things very seriously at all, of course. But I must say that this particular book by Kars, Finite and Infinite Games, is the kind of book that in fact can actually, if one really dwelled on the book and reflected on it over a period of time, it can really fundamentally alter one's way of thinking about the world. One can't say that about many books. And the books about which one does make an observation of that kind tend to be invariably religious books, or almost invariably. I'm certain that there are people who have felt the same way about, let's say, the Communist Manifesto, perhaps, uh, or perhaps, in some cases, uh, a particular work by Gandhi, let's say, Hind Swaraj. Right? And surely one can think of other works in the secular domain that might have um, perhaps altered the life of someone. Uh, I think that books that claim to do that, books with titles such as Seven Steps to Happiness or Seven Roads to Success, right? I think that those books uh, almost invariably can be left out of our reckoning today. Um, I think they belong not in a library, they belong somewhere else. So what is Carse's book about, Finite and Infinite Games? 
what is the nature of this distinction? So let's begin, first of all, with the problem of trying to classify this book. You know, so imagine that you were running a bookstore, um, Barnes and Noble. So there are sections in a bookstore. There is history, and then if it's a large section, they may divide that into another 10 or 15 sections, American history, European history, Indian history, history of China, Russia, um, it might just simply say history of the Far East, and they might lump China and Japan and Korea together, right? And then there'll be a section on anthropology, biography, autobiography, cinema, etc. Well, where would one place this game, uh, this particular book, Finite and Infinite Games? So I've, I've, uh, I've, uh, in fact, I actually conducted such an exercise, and I found that invariably it had been this book had been placed in the sports section under something like miscellaneous, because if, if the book was, let's say, obviously about basketball, then you would, if you had a very large sports section and then you had subsections, uh, boxing, football, basketball, hockey, and so on, then obviously a book on basketball would go in a section on basketball. But a book like this, Finite and Infinite Games, uh, I think that the clerk at the bookstore probably looks at, looked at the book and thought, well, it says games, so let me put it in the sports section. This book is not about sports. It's not really even about, for the most part, about games as people ordinarily think of games. So one can think of sports as games, one can think of all the sports that I've mentioned and many others, boxing, uh, we, could, we could add baseball, we could add, for those who are familiar with kabaddi in India, we could add that as well. And then of course there are board games, right? Most famously something like Ludo or Monopoly. But this book is not about board games as such, nor about sports. Although to explain what this book is about, we can take the instance of sports. So let's consider it this way. What is it about the nature of sports in America that makes sports very different here than how sports were thought of in most other societies? And I think the first fundamental fact of playing sports in America is not merely that almost everything is professionalized and that even when it's not professionalized, there is a huge paraphernalia of things attached to, to sports. So, by, so cycling is certainly professionalized, perhaps not as professionalized as basketball or baseball or American football, all of which are professional leagues as well, and where people at the very top earn gargantuan salaries, right? But even cycling, I mean, it's very difficult to find people here who just go cycling without putting on a helmet and cycling gear and you know having a really good bicycle. Right? Everything becomes a chore in this country and everything is professionalized. But this is not really the principal characteristic that I'm interested in when thinking about Carse's book. What is singularly interesting is that let's take a basketball game. Now, in a basketball game, you cannot have a draw. At the end of the game, there has to be a winner and therefore there is a loser. Of course, some commentators, it, particularly if it happened to be a very close contest and one team lost, but somehow won the hearts of everyone by their gritty performance. So then the commentator might say in certain circumstances, well, there is a winner, but both the teams really won because they won over hearts. Now, I don't think this is said often, but I've heard that expression once in a while. But 
looked at it in a more mechanical way, there is unquestionably the fact that it is impossible to play a game of basketball without achieving a result, which leads to a winner and a loser. So if you're playing in the National Basketball Association, the NBA, the professional league, and of course, the same thing could be argued for football, and the same thing would be argued for baseball. If you were playing in that league, and so uh, a, a basketball game uh, is a 48 minutes duration, that is playing time, actual playing time, because the game might be drawn out over two and a half hours with timeout, timeouts and then with a break uh, after the first quarter. So it's divided into four quarters of 12 minutes each, a break after the first quarter, and then halftime, and then a break after the third quarter uh, uh, as well. Uh, and then, of course, all the timeouts. So um, an NBA game, particularly during the playoffs, might, in fact, in uh, a 48-minute a game might drag out to two and a half, three hours. But if at the end of regulation time, if at the end of 48 minutes, the score happened to be tied at 90-90, then the game goes into overtime. And if at the end of five minutes of overtime, the score is tied at, let's say, 98-98, then the game goes into a second overtime, and then a third overtime if necessary, and a fourth overtime until such time as we have a decisive winner and therefore a loser. That is what we might call a finite game, a game that is played with the express intention not simply of producing a winner, but with the intention of producing an end an end, an outcome of therefore bringing a halt to the act of playing. Now, it is a submission of James Carr, who is a philosopher of religion, that the only worthwhile games thinking about are infinite games. This particular insight is staggering. It is staggering because as one goes through this short book of 125, 150 odd pages, cars will extend that argument to every aspect of our lives. So, Paragraph seven, oddly enough, this book following on, uh, on the heels of the previous book that I had discussed, Swan Lin Quiz Exterminate All the Brutes, which also has chapters, but then each chapter has numbered paragraphs and the numbered paragraphs are consecutive through all the chapters. So. You know, one way to think about it is simply the book having so many chapters, but the other way to think about it is having just a set of numbered paragraphs or numbered sections rather, which is exactly the case in this book as it was in Exterminate All the Brutes. So uh, Mr. Carr says, there are at least two kinds of games. This is section one, paragraph one. One could be called finite, the other infinite. A finite game is played for the purpose of winning, an infinite game for the purpose of continuing the play. And then he describes the circumstances under which we know when, when a finite game is being played, players have to consent to the fact that there's going to be an outcome, right? We know that someone has won the game when all the players have agreed who among them is the winner. Paragraph three, just as it is essential for a finite game to have a definitive ending, it must also have a precise beginning. We, we don't think of that often. Therefore, we can speak of finite games as having temporal boundaries, to which, of course, all players must agree. But players must agree to the establishment of spatial and numerical boundaries as well. That is, a game must be played within a marked area and with specified players. 
Spatial boundaries are evident in every finite conflict from the simplest board and court games to world wars. The opponents in World War II agreed not to bomb Heidelberg and Paris and declared Switzerland outside the boundaries of conflict. When unnecessary and excessive damage is inflicted by one of the sides in warfare, a question arises as to the legitimacy of the victory that side may claim, even whether it has been a war at all and not simply gratuitous, unwarranted violence. When Sherman burned his way from Atlanta to the sea, so for some listeners who may not be aware, he's referring here to the American Civil War. He so ignored the sense of spatial limitation that for many persons, the war was not legitimately won by the Union Army and has in fact never been concluded. Right? Now, what is what are the implications of this insight? So what Kars will do is he will develop this argument, which as I said, to my mind is staggeringly creative and extraordinarily brilliant. And I use these particular insights in developing an argument that in an article that I wrote about Mohan Das Gandhi uh, on the occasion of um, uh, uh, his birthday, uh, October 2nd in 2019. Right, so that marked the 150th birth anniversary of, of Gandhi. And it's in connection with that that I wrote an article called Gandhi as a player of infinite games. Right? And I think that I think that that if I describe very briefly the article, one gets a flavor of this book as well. But I will revert to some passages from from Pars's book, passages where he discusses sexuality, where he discusses gardening. So, you know, when often we think of gardening, as successful gardening as uh, particularly if you are, particularly if you are doing home gardening uh, as uh, uh, the form, as the kind of gardening which produces an outcome. So, you know, you're growing a vegetable garden, you get a good crop of, of, of tomatoes uh, or zucchini or eggplant. If if you're growing flowers, you get you get a you you get a, a you know a, a, a bountiful uh, uh, harvest of colors that dazzle you. Now, Kars has a different way of looking at what a garden really is, because looking at the garden and the way in which most people do makes one into a finite player of games. What would an infinite player of games do with a garden? Okay. But before I move to that, let me go back to, to the own, my own piece that I wrote on Gandhi, because what I was trying to suggest here was that Gandhi cannot in fact actually be viewed through the lens of social sciences cannot be viewed through the lens of the social sciences to help us really get insight into the nature of his achievement. Here was a man who renounced sex, the sexual act in his late 30s, who took the vow of brahmacharya but who loved the touch of women. A man who renounced sex, but did not renounce sexuality. And thus one finds him experimenting at the end of his life. Okay. Here's a man who said, not a leaf moves without the will of God. But a man who at the same time said, one doesn't, and all have to believe in religion, to believe in truth. A man who almost never visited a temple and a land awash with temples, 
a man who declared himself a devout Hindu right? and said one doesn't have to believe in God at all, even to be a Hindu. A man who many say was autocratic, but who in a very different way was extraordinarily democratic, where every bone of his body was democratic and yet who could be very stern and autocratic. And perhaps those who are interested in real politics would say Gandhi actually muscled his way into the highest positions. Uh, a man who refused to countenance any dissent to his political authority. Those have been some of the critiques that have been leveled. A man who, let's take yet another example, revered the Ram Charit Manas and said at the same time that he unequ unequivocally rejected certain verses in the Ram Charit Manas in Tulsi Das's book that did not agree with his conscience. Right? And of course, Satyagra was itself the ultimate expression of infinite play, because, in, because when one deploys Satyagra, there can be no winners or losers, which is why Gandhi always understood that the opposition to colonialism in India was, in, was intended not simply to liberate Indians from colonial rule, the anti-colonial movement was certainly intended to do that, to furnish independence to Indians. But it was also intended to liberate the English from their own worst tendencies. The colonizer has to be emancipated just as much as the colonized. So in the most majestic ways that we can think of, Gandhi was unquestionably what Kars would call a player of infinite games. And going back to that metaphor of, of sports now, and my narrative of sports in American life, I think one can see here that American sports, in fact, reflect something which is fundamentally the case about American society. Just as, just as in American sports, one cannot have ambiguity. One must have a winner and a loser. One cannot simply end the play with a draw. And therefore games must go into overtime. Let's note here, that the most popular game in India, the most popular sport in India, cricket, is not a game of that nature. In fact, cricket test matches typically ended in draws. They were just as common as cricket test matches, which ended with, quote, a decisive outcome. And of course, one of the ways in which cricket has been transformed is, is not simply that that the newer variations in the course of the last two, three decades have shortened the game. But these shortened forms of cricket show the deep influence of Americanization on a sport such as cricket. Because now the, the, the viewer of cricket, the spectator, the fan of cricket demands a decisive result. And that's what T20 games and the 50 overs limited games are intended to produce, a decisive outcome, unlike the original form of cricket test matches. Okay. And so how does this reflect? How does the American reflect? the nature of American society, because I think fundamentally in America, and I'm quite certain that, that Karls must have been prompted by that insight in his own way in, in producing this very book, 
in America, there's very little room, very little tolerance for ambiguity. Right? Everything is either black or white. Or as George Bush would have said, apropos of the war that he decided to launch against the Taliban, right? and apropos of his intent to, to smoke out Osama bin Laden from the caves in which he was allegedly hiding, Bush said, either you're with us or you're against us. Right? And that, of course, produced a fundamental ethical problem for people such as myself, who said, well, we're neither for you nor against you, necessarily. Just as one might not support Osama bin Laden, but one might yet see, perhaps in some ways, the logic that led him to what he did. Now, Kars discusses a great many things. So I've already indicated, uh, apropos of my observations of Gandhi's experiments with sexuality, how Kars might have actually viewed the whole question of sexuality and, and what is a person who is an infinite, infinite player of sexuality doing. So the infinite player of sexuality is not, for example, fundamentally interested in the act of consummation of sex, right? Or in the production of, quote, the orgasm. Rather, the infinite player of, sex, of sexuality is interested in touch, for example. The whole phenomenology of touch. But Kars will extend this, this insight to many, many other spheres of life. And I'd like to give a couple of illustrations of that by way of bringing my brief discussion of this book to a conclu conclusion. So here we have paragraph 86, where he talks about, begins by talking about machinery. In still another way, is machinery contradictory? Using it against itself and against ourselves, we also use machinery against each other. And one of the things that we have to understand about Kars is that he might seem to uh, very much engage in paradoxes and even relish uh, paradoxes. One of his books, uh, Kars authored seven books in all. So he was you know, a writer, uh, as, as well as being a renowned teacher, apparently. I, I'm also given to understand from the Wikipedia page on him. It's a very, very short page. Tells us something about a culture such as the one we are living with, where one of the most creative thinkers produced in this country gets a Wikipedia entry of perhaps five lines or 10 lines uh, and some influencer, you know, of no consequence really at all, uh, will get perhaps 500 lines. So th this Wikipedia entry on James Carr's tells us that this book when it came out was immensely popular and has been translated into apparently a score of languages, but I must confess that I've never yet encountered anyone barring one person who had led me to this book initially. Um, I have never encountered anyone who uh, over the course of the last several decades who knew about this book. Right? Uh, so so Kars uh, was a, apparently a renowned teacher and he, he as, I, as I mentioned, he wrote several books. Uh, and one of the books is called The Religious Case Against Belief. The Religious Case Against Belief, not the religious case against atheism, nor the atheist case against religion, right? The religious case against belief. So I, so I think that one has to have a very different kind of sensibility to really understand Kars and to have an appreciation of the kind of insight that he has. But let us consider further his deliberations about machinery and in particular about the instruments of war. All weapons are designed, he says, this is section 86, are designed 
to affect others without affecting ourselves, to make others answerable to the technology in our control. Weapons are the equipment of finite games designed in such a way that they do not maximize the play, but eliminate it. So now here we see how he brings back the question of play, right? The infinite player of games plays to keep the play in play. And there is never any end. There is never any end. And there is really, by the same token, never any beginning. Weapons are meant not to win contests, but to end them. Killers are not victors. They are unopposed competitors, players without a game, living contradictions. This is particularly the case with the airborne electronic weaponry of the present century, where the operator deals only with the technology, buttons, blips, lights, dials, levers, levers, computer data, and never with the unseen opponent. And this book was written long before drones really became the ultimate weapon against the unseen enemy, right? Indeed, so empty of drama is the modern machinery of slaughter that it is intended to assault enemies only while they are still unseen. This reaches an extreme form in the belief that our enemies are not unseen because they are enemies, but our enemies because they are unseen. I, I think an insight of this time, we have to reflect on it for a long period of time. We have to go back to the passage repeatedly. There is a logic in the instrumentality of death that leads us to killing the unseen because they are unseen. The crudest spear or sword is raised by an attacker because the independent existence of another cannot be countenanced because the other cannot be seen as an other. And here I skip a few passages, a few sentences to come to the conclusion of this particular section. Not everyone who uses machinery is a killer, but when the use of machinery springs from our attempt to respond to the indifference of nature with an indifference of our own to nature, with an indifference of our own to nature, right? From our attempt to respond, let me repeat, to respond to the indifference of nature with an indifference of our own to nature, we have begun to acquire the very indifference to persons that has led to the century's grandest crimes by its most civilized nations. Right? So in conclusion, let me, let me now very briefly move on to the section 88, which is on gardening. And where cars also offer some observations on travel. Inasmuch as gardens do not conclude with a harvest and are not played for a certain outcome, one never arrives anywhere with a garden. A garden is a place where growth is found. It has its own source of change. One does not bring change to a garden but comes to a garden prepared for change and therefore prepared to change. It is possible to deal with growth only out of growth. True parents do not see it that their children grow in a particular way. According to a preferred pattern or scripted stages, but they see to it that they grow with their children. How many parents would be willing to admit to this? And I must say that though I had read this book 20 odd years ago, that's when I first encountered it. That what Carr says about parenting, I di it did not sufficiently register itself on my mind at that time. I wish it had because I think perhaps I might have myself 
engaged in a different form of parenting with my own children, right? True parents do not see to, do not see to it that their children grow in a particular way. Right? I think virtually all parents do exactly that, unfortunately, right? And of course, in a society, in modern society, we even have what are called helicopter parents, right? According to a preferred pattern or script, scripted stages, but they see to it that they grow with their children. The character of one's parenting, if it is generally dramatic, must be constantly altered from within as the children change from within. So too with teaching or working with or loving each other. It is in the garden that we discover what travel truly is. We do not journey to a garden, but by way of it. Genuine travel has no destination. I think that we have heard others say as well. Travelers do not go somewhere, but constantly discover they are somewhere else. And here we see that Kars has a somewhat different formulation because many who agree that genuine travel has no destination will say, well, the real charm of travel really is in the journey. It's in, it's in getting there, so to speak, right? But, but that's really only a variation, right? It's only a variation because Carr says, travelers do not go somewhere, but constantly discover they are somewhere else. Since gardening is a way not of subduing the indifference of nature, but of raising one's own spontaneity to respond to the disregarding vagaries and unpredictabilities of nature, we do not look on nature as a sequence of changing scenes, but look on ourselves as persons in passage. So therefore, genuine travelers, as he points out, travel not to overcome distance, but to discover distance. It is not distance that makes travel necessary, but travel that makes distance possible. I think this book, some will simply say it's a form of mystification that Cars is simply just playing around with words, trying to sound a little too clever. I'm certain that some people will reach that conclusion. I think that is far from being the case. I think that this book is a marvelous expression of the kind of creativity we require to lead rich lives and to help us in these dire times. Perhaps all times are dire. I think given the kind of narrative of progress that Western civilization has deluded itself into and bequeathed to the rest of the world into believing that I think our times are perhaps even more dire precisely because we have a lot more to overcome. So as I mentioned, Kars passed away about six, seven months ago. I only found that out quite recently when I just, in, in connection with thinking about doing a, a, a brief talk on this book, I thought I might as well look him up a little bit to see his whereabouts now, because I knew that he lived in New York and then um, became aware uh, when I read a very short obituary um, written by some friends of his uh, on his passing last September. Uh, the New York Times had no obituary of him at all. But I do think that that James Carr's is unquestionably one of the most brilliant and creative thinkers that I've come across. So I recommend this book very highly. Thank you.